Good morning. My name is Jeff Newton, and I'm a partner at the corporate department of Baker Botts, and we're pleased to welcome you this morning to this beautiful setting at the debate chamber at Old Parkland. We are, this um, part of our program is the director's panel, and we have, um, we have with us today three directors and one advisor to a director who are, will share with us some of their insights regarding um, current issues, topics, processes that, that come up for boards of directors. Uh, and I'll start by introducing each of our panel members. We have here this morning, we have two panel members here in person and two panel members who are participating virtually. Uh, first of all, I'll introduce Ron McRae. Ron is on the board of directors of A.H. Below Corporation, a uh, local news and information company. He's also served as an executive for a variety of companies, including uh, Nike, Kimberly Clark, and for a nonprofit career education corporation, works currently with a private equity firm, um, RLH Equity Partners, and also works at the Federal Investment Thrift Board. Ron also has extensive involvement with um, nonprofits, including the governing boards of Cornell University and uh, Charleston Jazz. So he has a variety of different um, uh, things on his plate. Also um, joining us here to my right in person is Elaine Agather. Uh, and Elaine is the Dallas Regional Head for JP Morgan. Uh, and she, one of the largest banks in the United States, and she also serves as the South and Midwest head and as a managing director of J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Um, uh, Elaine has um, worked also, also has a, a fine um, set of um, nonprofits she worked with, including Fort Worth Performing Arts uh, and also the Dallas Museum of Art here in town. Our third participant joining us virtually is Mike Nicholas. Uh, Mike serves as the chairman of the board of Eagle Materials, a construction products company that works in cement, gypsum wallboard, and other construction products. Mike has served on the board of Eagle for um, upwards of 20 years, uh, or almost 20 years, and he um, also um, has worked for a variety of other companies, including in private equity, working as, as CEO of Highlander Partners, and in, um, in investment banking for Stevens and DLJ. Uh, finally, joining us uh, in person also to my left is Elena Brooks. Elena is Chief Legal and Administrative Officer for NLINK. She oversees a wide variety of areas, starting with legal but not ending there. She also covers regulatory, human resources, um, contract administration, and public affairs. Importantly for this panel, she heads up significant initiatives at NLINK in two areas that are very topical today. One of them is ESG and sustainability, and the other she's a co-head along with the CEO of NLINK of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Initiative at NLINK. Um, Elena will add her perspective to this panel as an advisor to boards, so um, any board member is free at any time to toss a question to Elena <laughs> if, they, if they want some advice. Um, so with, the, with those introductions, let me, um, let me start off and let's get to the meat of the, um, of the presentation. I think um, what our, the format will be is I will ask several questions of um, each, uh, I'll ask questions of each of the directors, but we really do want to have some audience participation as well. So please, if you have questions um, in the audience, please um, send those questions in. Better to get them in a little earlier in the session because it's hard to process ones that come in at the very end, and we'll, we'll leave time at the end of this session to, to address those questions. So the first set of questions um, we have, and I'll, I'll start off by uh, having some questions regarding um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic has had an effect on, on any number of things in our lives, but in particular here, what we'd like to focus on is its effect on the board of directors, the duties of the board, it, their, its functions, the ability of the board really to get done its crucial job in a corporation. So starting with Ron, uh, let's, let's start, Ron, with a question on board strategy. Um, you know, there's, the, the board's role in strategy is, is really crucial, and it's the director for each corporation strategy, and there's a wide range of areas that the board is active in, such as capital allocation, <coughs> continuity of operations, succession planning, and j you name it, the board um, has to oversee strategy. How do you think um, things have changed in terms of the board's assessment of strategy uh, during the pandemic? Uh, good, good question, uh, Jeff. Generally speaking, uh, the board's uh, uh, responsibility, in my view, for 
for uh, oversight is, is, is unchanged, generally speaking. Um, uh, risk management, uh, overseeing strategy, uh, capital allocation, those still are the, uh, the gravamen of the board's uh, responsibility today. The context is different. So some of the issues that, that come to mind are uh, liquidity. If, if you're in uh, the airline business or depending on the restaurant business you're in, uh, you may need, uh, you, you will likely need cash to get through uh, the storm. And if you, do, if you don't have it, it may be a matter, it may be a matter of, uh, of, of survival. If you are in a, a, a retailer, uh, I think COVID has, 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 uh, has spawned um, a lot of away from home activity from the standpoint of shopping. If you're a retailer, you've got to think about how do I access my customers who don't want to enter a retail door anymore? And uh, can I survive until the time that the, the, um, uh, the uh, pandemic is behind us? That's a severe uh, revenue, revenue challenge. You've got to think about that. I would say also sourcing has, has become an issue. Um, what, it, coincident with COVID, we have had uh, entanglements with uh, China uh, and other countries uh, that, uh, so, that from, from where we saw source lots of product and material. And uh, the question has to be asked of, of most companies who do that. Well, how do we, ha how do we rethink or reimagine our sourcing so that we are not tied up by these uh, in, these uh, these uh, these burps in relationships with China uh, and other other uh, countries. The other uh, point that I would make that uh, boards have to think about in terms of uh, revenue, for sure, if not go to market, is the social distancing thing. So, if you're social distancing, how do you sell your product? If you are social distancing. What, what implications does that have for uh, a big use of capital, which is space, rent, mm -hmm. the kind of uh, space that you need to occupy in your various facilities? So I would say, um, you know, liquidity, uh, 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 social distancing, and sourcing are, are three issues that uh, most companies, a lot of companies find themselves facing uh, these days as a result of COVID. Great. I have a follow-up question to that, Elaine, for you, um, if, um, if you'd like to take it, which is, um, you know, obviously J.P. Morgan is a, is a great source of liquidity uh, and, you know, was involved in um, a number, has been involved and continues to be involved in a number of the initiatives. How has that, how has that posed a challenge for, for J.P. Morgan being involved in the PPP loans and the mainstream loans and so forth? Uh, well, immediately all of our lines of credit were drawn because liquidity is key right now. And Ron mentioned it, but as a, as a board, as a firm, you wanna make sure you're prepared. And there, this has been an unknown, unprecedented time for every single person. Mm -hmm. I think too, the PPP loans that you mentioned, very carefully, mm -hmm. and the rules kept changing. And so I think as a firm, we were very concerned about our small businesses and made, sure that we were there and we tried to accommodate it, but we've all had to pivot so quickly on so many different things. And then I think, you know, obviously this was in the press. We saw immediately that there was some wrongdoing by, by some of our employees and we addressed it immediately. And we're the first to say, you know, with, with changes, sometimes uh, we have to be careful about how it's all done and executed. Well, certainly a program like that that's implemented on the back of an envelope mm -hmm. in, a, in a couple of week period as really a challenging right. one and hard, right. hard to implement. And I think along with COVID and, and Ron has mentioned this, you have employees that have done an extraordinary job at home mm -hmm. and everything from moving money to doing the PP loans at home, trying to figure it out. So it's been extraordinary. Elena, a quick follow up with you as well. Obviously you work um, in the midstream sector of the oil and gas industry, your company is there. And um, this um, COVID crisis not only brought with it, um, you know, the normal COVID effects that affect all companies, but sort of this dramatic um, March, April effect on the oil and gas industry where oil prices went negative and by some measures for some period. How did that, how does that sort of uh, play out in, in sort of strategic thinking for a company like yours? 
Yeah, um, well, it's interesting. I think some of the important things about this are what, what didn't change. Um, obviously, there was kind of a crisis mentality with COVID and with the, the downturn in the oil and gas industry and those kind of things. But what you want with your board, obviously, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of long term change being driven by those things and sustainability and DEI. But you want them focused on that. You want them focused forward on strategy and moving forward. And so I was really focused on and have been all along on making sure that that's what our board can focus on. And what I mean by that is making sure that all along they've known about they've been involved in our ERM, our enterprise risk management program, making sure that our board has seen a deep dive on our crisis response plan so that I didn't have a board wondering, can, can NLINK survive this? Can NLINK, you know, do, are they, have they thought about commodity price risks? Have they thought about their employee population? Can they get them all to work safely? They didn't have to worry about those details of our risk program. They were able to focus on the big picture of these challenges and how NLINK could turn those challenges into opportunities from a strategic perspective. Well, it's nice when your preparations are, you know, are even ready for something like uh, as dramatic as, as yeah, COVID. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, of course, we hadn't really talked to our board about, you know, whether or not our, we had, a, you know, we could get to the office. That wasn't uh -huh. something that specific, but we had certainly talked about risk of safety and risk of commodity prices, and they knew that we had the mechanism set up to tackle those problems. Right. And I think that's what gave them the comfort to not have to have those detailed in the weeds conversations and to really be able to focus on how can we attack these big picture challenges. Excellent. Okay. Well, having talked about strategy for a few minutes, I think um, let's turn our attention to the effect of the COVID crisis on board processes. Um, obviously, an important role of, the, of a board member is to be informed, to understand um, what's going on at the company. Um, those are facilitated not only by in-person meetings where um, you know, the board receives reports from management and receives background regarding the company, but also a um, result of informal contacts with management from time to time. All of those are important. Um, Mike Nicholas, let me ask you, um, what is your sense of how the COVID crisis has affected processes uh, at the board level? And has, have boards been able to do their job as effectively, uh, or are there some real challenges and obstacles for the board in doing their jobs? Uh, good morning, Jeff, thanks. Um, uh, in terms of um, processes, uh, you know, what, what, what we experienced during COVID was um, uh, a lot of communication. Um, we were having weekly uh, board meetings, obviously virtually. Um, I was meeting with our CEO on an almost daily basis. Uh, initially, early on, the focus was on employee safety. Um, and obviously that continued, you know, through the entire and, and is continuing to this day. But the, uh, 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 you know, once, once we were um, comfortable that we had the policies, processes, practices in place that are safe, the next thing that we had to deal with, that our management had to deal with, and that our board had to be informed about was how do we operate? Um, you know, we have big $500 million cement plants located across the country and, and gypsum wallboard facilities. Uh, Ninety-five percent of our employees are in manufacturing; they're not in offices. So our people had to go to work, and so we had to deal with that and keep them safe uh, while while they were doing it. Um, so I would just say, you know, uh, lots of communication, um, huge focus on safety. Uh, we also had to do all of this in the middle of a, there was some conversation earlier about activist uh, shareholders in the ISS conversation. We were in the middle of dealing with an activist shareholder in the middle of all this as well. So there was a lot of board communication that had to deal with that as well. But, um, you know, I don't think there was a huge difference uh, in terms of how we communicated other than frequency. Mm -hmm. And obviously the topics, which were, uh, as, as I mentioned before, safety and daily operations. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, let me, um, let me ask you, Mike, just an um, operational question. Are you guys back now to in-person meetings or planning to get back to them? Or are you still fully virtual for board meetings? Um, we are uh, 
uh, we are still virtual. Um, we had our uh, shareholder meeting and annual meeting in early August. Uh, I attended in person. I was the only board member that attended in person with our management team. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, we're still virtual. Uh, I think everybody's more comfortable with that. Um, and really, it's about protecting the management team as well. Uh, you know, we need to run our company. We can't have our executives being sick and, and uh, um, you know, not all, all of our directors are lo local and, and, and traveling in by plane and exposing our management team to uh, people that might have been exposed to, you know, doesn't make sense to us. So we're continuing to be virtual. Um, we did have a virtual shareholder meeting. I think in the future we are going to go to even hopefully, you know, post COVID, we will go to dual in person and uh, and virtual. I don't think there's any reason to stop doing that. And um, you know, I've just been very, very pleased in how uh, uh, the board the board mm -hmm. there was lots of one on one phone calls uh, and email communication. Um, I was really pleased that about the first 25 phone calls I got or emails that I got from board members were all about our employee safety. That was the first question everyone asked was, how are we, you know, protecting our employees? A as directors, you know, our job is to protect our company and to preserve our company. And, you know, you're nothing without your people. And, um, you know, we can shut our plants down and we can, you know, close them for three or four or five months if we have to. Uh, you can't start them back up again without your people. These are, com you know, complex, complex equipment, complex manufacturing processes. And your people need to know that you are behind them and that you care about their safety and that their safety is more important than this quarter's earnings. And uh, I feel, you know, really good that we communicated that to, their, to our employees and engendered a lot of loyalty from that. You know, we ask for employee loyalty. Um, we need to, as directors, we need to remember that's a two-way street. We need to be as loyal to them as, as we expect them to be to us. Right, right. Okay. Jeff, if I could piggyback off of what uh, sure. Mike said. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, I, 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 would, I would agree that uh, the frequency of communication if not the substance of the communication it may have changed a little bit, uh, more than a little bit uh, as a result of COVID. One thing that comes to mind for me, uh, Mike, and I wonder how you guys think about this, or you, uh, uh, Elaine or Elena, um, you, can't, you, you don't get a chance to see in face, in person, the facilities or new products. And when you make investments uh, in new products or facilities, it, there's nothing like actually seeing the embodiment, the incarnation of what you have invested in or the performance of it. And that's one thing that I would say a lot of us lose in, the, uh, uh, in this uh, virtual uh, COVID environment. Ab absolutely. Um, I, we are building 400 new branches across the country and I have several in my region that I am, I've been sent virtual you know, videos of it, there's nothing like, I wanna go see it. And I'm, I'm just about ready to get on that plane and go see it. Oh. And, and also just, you know, the, well, I could talk, but the impact of seeing the people in person too. Virtual has been great, yes. Yes. but it's a team sport usually. And not being able for us to look at you right now and have that, that's gonna wear thin and we're gonna to have to get people back in at some point. One of the areas I've heard a number of people comment on, I'd be interested in thought from any of you all on is that the, um, the difficulty of hiring, integrating new executives, building teams um, during, this, um, you know, during this COVID crisis right. is really difficult. I, I personally know some general counsel or other executives who started at companies have been there now three or four months, have never been at the headquarters right. of the company, have met people by Zoom, and yeah. the idea of transmitting corporate culture in this environment right. is really difficult. I said, how am I gonna teach them how to shake hands? <laughs> and they said, well, you're not gonna be shaking hands for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've- um... You know, Jeff, I, 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 I mentioned that, uh, you know, we were dealing with an activist shareholder situation um, uh, really uh, immediately preceding the COVID crisis, it, it, our, our uh, 
interaction with our activist shareholders started in January of this year, um, we decided and you know publicly announced that we were going to split our company into two publicly traded companies. Uh, we were two months, three months away from um, executing on that split, tax-free spinoff of one of our businesses. Uh, in the midst of that, instead of one public company, we're going to have two public companies. And so we need two boards of directors and we need two sets of executives. And so we were deep in um, recruiting mode for both board members and executives of, uh, you know, uh, of these two companies. And, and it created incredible uh, complexity and uncertainty. Um, we've now publicly announced that we have delayed our spin, uh, but it's hard to go you know, interview executives when you can't tell them when the job is going to be available. Sure. Is our spin going right. to happen three months from now? Or is it going to happen a year from now? And, you know, as I sit here today, we just don't know that. So that was a real curveball that, uh, you know, has made the whole board uh, interaction and, uh, you know, much, much more complex. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's, let's just turn to a slightly different um, area. And Elena, this is for you is, um, you know, some of the areas that you oversee, um, legal, regulatory, risk management, and, you know, I guess recently, um, you know, HR, which is a challenging area, those are all areas where, um, uh, you know, that have been involved in the, in the COVID crisis and, and raised challenges. How do you, how have you worked on, you mentioned a little bit before that you, because you had an active program, it was easier to deal with some of the aspects of the crisis, but how do you view your job in terms of, um, informing directors, keeping them up to speed in all of those areas during during the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I would echo some of what some of the others have said. Uh, you know, we certainly have increased our communications um, and both formally and informally, you know, I think, again, having relationships with the directors, it's been very easy for some of them to call me and have some informal conversations um, about, about those issues and what's been going on. We also sort of during the, the peak crisis time, you know, uh, our CEO, Barry Davis, he was having a weekly regular communication with the board um, just to make sure that they were all getting communication about, you know, what our employee status was, what our plans for getting employees back in the office safely and you know we as an essential business and having plants and things that you can't necessarily just turn off and send everyone home um, we had employees who were working you know in in facilities right through the heart of the crisis and so we did increase our communication to all of them about that and um, and really did do some education too you know I've spent an enormous amount of time studying you know what what the what we've heard from the government and what we've heard from regulators about what's safe and how to set all that up and so we've really probably provided more detail than than normal um and you know but to make sure that our board is comfortable and, and safe or, or comfortable with what we're doing to keep our employees safe so again they can focus on on, on what what they should be focused on. I, I imagine that as mike had mentioned for eagle at nlink you got a lot of um questions about safety issues at, at, yeah. at the beginning, especially. And um, w was that a big focus of the board in terms of, of turning to those issues? Yeah, again, you know, I think with our, in our line of business, safety has always been a big right. focus. Um, you know, in fact, my mask um, has our goal zero safety program <laughs> on it. So we're, we're always focused on safety at Inlink. Um, but, you know, this was a different aspect of safety. It was you need a pipeline control room. Um, that's, that's critical to making sure that your pipelines are running safely and they don't have leaks. And how do you get all those people in a room safely? How do you keep them all in there? And so, you know, we immediately jumped on those protocols and made sure that, you know, we communicated them to the board, that they understood that we weren't putting our employees at unnecessary risk, you know, that we had instituted cleaning protocols, that we provided the PPE that people needed. We rotating shifts. We're currently back in the office and we are doing a rotating shift in order to reduce density okay. and requiring masks. You know, it's it's not always fun, but it's allowed us to to get people back in the office who need to be in a safe way. Are you holding in-person board meetings now? Or is, we or have is remained... Mix? We've remained virtual with the board, right. um, and, and I think, again, I think that will probably last for a little while. Um, we have really done a lot on video because I do think it's at least it helps, um, even though everybody has to get out of their sweatpants. Um, it does help to at least see each other and see body language and that kind of thing. But, but we're really missing that, that in-person piece. You know, I think Elaine mentioned this. You know, we, we would often have our senior leadership team typically at a board meeting, 
and that, that's harder to do in a video setting where you've, you know, now you've got a ton of little screens. Um, we would bring key employees in for certain meetings to present on a topic to really let our board see some of our up and comers and see our culture in person. And, and those things that I think are so critical to a board. Um, and we just, you know, we haven't been able to do that. And if this is gonna last long term, I think we're gonna have to find ways to do that in this, in this new world. Cause we can't just, you can pause it for a little while, but we can't let it go forever. Some of these people issues are really the most difficult in, in yeah. some ways. They, yeah, yeah. Really and the only other thing I'd add, the lawyer in me has to add this. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing this has created though is with all the informal, is for good corporate governance, you do have to make sure we've got good records. You know, I love that, you know, our CEO is communicating weekly with the board in an informal phone, informal phone call, but I made regular contact with him. Hey, is there anything that we need to make sure gets in the minutes? Anything that we need to discuss at the next meeting that you guys discussed? Because here the board's doing all this great work, focusing on the company and ensuring things are going well, but you're not really getting credit from a corporate governance perspective unless there's a record of that. So I would encourage, um, companies to make sure that they're they're doing that. Even it's as simple as in the minutes, noting that those weekly calls were taking place and what topics yeah. were discussed. Yeah, well, great suggestion. Great suggestion. Okay, I think um, maybe enough for now on the COVID crisis. Um, I want to move to a different topic, um, one that is also very topical and timely, but um, one that has a very different flavor, and that is racial equity, racial justice, and all the events that took place after the um, death of George Floyd on May 25th. Um, right in the sort of as the COVID crisis um, was in its peak, um, you know, the, the George, death of George Floyd sort of hit the newspapers and then the ensuing events, um, protests, um, which, which are still with us today, have had a tremendous impact on companies across the nation. Uh, and I thought it would be helpful to um, have some discussion of uh, generally of, of this issue and how and companies' responses. Um, and I'll start, I think, with, Elaine, with you. And, uh, you know, you are obviously at J.P. Morgan, you have Jamie Dimon, who is a very outspoken leader, and um, not only on this issue, but many others. But I think in particular on this issue, he, uh, he's been front and center and, and um, ta you know, taking a leadership role with industry groups and with the company itself. Um, what do you, you know, what do you think, though, in terms of, uh, it's, it's great to have a CEO like that who's proactive. What do you think the board's role ought to be in terms of addressing these issues, um, you know, separate from management? You know, I think Jamie's really good about speaking for the board, too. He discusses all this with the board. The board is the, uh, someone said, protect the firm, but it's also to make sure the firm does the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the board has been, at J.P. Morgan, has been very vocal in and um, uh, firm about how our firm should go through this. And I think it's really three things. It's authenticity, you know, the message throughout the firm. This can't just be a trend and we mm -hmm. go back to something else. I think that's been delivered that, you know, this is really a conversation that has to continue and make changes. And our firm is really good at making changes. I'm I look back 41 years ago when I started at the mm -hmm. bank. We've made a lot of changes for women. Mm -hmm. We've come a long way. I'm, you know, we're not done, but we've come mm -hmm. a long way. We can make changes. And it, mm -hmm. it starts with your own firm first, the message. Right. I think you have to put your money where your mouth is. We have given a tremendous commitment to sort of equalizing the communities and keeping, keeping the, the job growth. And the other thing we've committed to is hiring I mean, it starts with your own firm and hiring, mm -hmm. because how are you going to have senior people, black senior leaders, if you don't hire them? And so we've committed to hiring 4,000 black students in our firm over the next five years after they graduate hiring them in. The other thing I think is really interesting, and it's not just racial injustice, but we've hired 3,000 felons <clears throat> because... As a lawyer, you know, sometimes you get a, you're, have a felony and it might have been something that you need to be forgiven for, and we couldn't hire. Mm. And so Jamie and the board's made an effort to, you know, let's, let's change that. Yeah. And so giving people a second chance and, and really making it an authentic conversation that continues. Well, that's, uh, that's really impressive. And that, that, those sort of commitments are, I mean, a lot of times people start with the board and focus on, 
is our board um, representative, and I think J.P. Morgan certainly is. Well, we are, but we have, you know, we have work there. Yeah. Um, we have work on our board, our, our operating committee, but if you look at, at leadership, that's really where Jamie's focused is more, you know, diverse leadership. We've got a lot of women. We've got a lot of women in, in senior, sure, you know. Sure. But it's, it's really focused on, on the ethnicity. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, let me open the same question up to the other three panelists in terms of what do you think the board itself can do uh, in this to address these situations? Um, what is the role of the board? How is, how, does, how is the board overseeing management in this area? Does the board need to have meetings on the subject? Does the board need to make its own policy statement or announcement? What, what is, what's your thought about how uh, the board can be involved? Anyone hey, of the well, my, hey, Jeff, think, is, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Ron. Oh, okay, so, sorry, Mike. I, I think, Jeff, um, first of all, I take exception to Elena's comment about pajamas. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Ron, stand, stand up. <laughs> Ron looks really good. <laughs> but but, but that, being, that, that being said, I, I think, uh, you know, boards uh, would benefit from uh, having a, a, a clear... Uh, sense about what what does it mean to have uh, some of these events that we have had happen? You know, in my view, and not everybody shares it. You know, the, the events that we have seen with George Floyd uh, and others uh, have highlighted a, a longstanding uh, legacy of disparate uh, racial impacts. The only thing that's new here is the iPhone camera, and we. We, but but depending on where you sit and where you live, you may not see these things. I've seen them all my life, okay? So it's not new to me. Um, I think when you, if you think about it, it has uh, its own legacy of, of, uh, of impact in how we think about talent, how we hire people, how we groom people. I don't, I don't understand why I was the only executive officer uh, who was black at Kimberly Clark or at Nike and have not been followed by one, okay? Or at Career Education Corps. Um, I think some of these issues highlight opportunities for, for, uh, for, for, for boards. I think that um, 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 you know, we're finding that, uh, like, like uh, Elaine mentioned, at Cornell, and I'm so proud of the program, we're finding that uh, we have uh, uh, capable students who were uh, ex-cons, and we put them through a bachelor's degree program, and they wind up becoming uh, uh, um, uh, uh, exemplary uh, employees and, and, and students. So, you know, I, I think, I, I think, you know, the United States, people bring to the, the boards, um, our boards are just a micro, microcosm of what we see in the United States and when what we live and i think boards will bring different perspectives and they need to come to a unified sort of perspective on how we as a company or as a board think about these issues and how do they reverberate through all of our processes as it relates to people in our organization ron a follow-up for you about uh, your, your role at cornell um, the uh, obviously the the job is very different being on the board of a university such as Cornell, in a fine institution with a great history and a very active board. I've known people who've worked on that board for many years. Um, uh, how has how involved was the board in um, you know this uh, you know this year both on the COVID crisis and also on George Floyd and racial equity issues uh, in giving direction to the university in terms of next steps. Yeah, uh, both uh, Cordell and the, the private, the, the uh, publicly traded companies with which I'm affiliated, and private companies have uh, thought about both issues. At Cornell, uh, at, we had to think, like many other universities, about how do we reopen? How do we reopen safely? And I'm proud to say that we have a as robust a plan as, as can be put in place with the help of, of CDC and, and NIH that uh, at least as of today, knock on wood, uh, has us uh, in a pretty, uh, pretty, safe, uh, pretty, safe, pretty safe place. We spent, uh, this is September, we started uh, meeting as an executive committee of the board probably in April or May to develop a plan or to review the plan developed by the administration and eventually to sign off on it. Um, 
Um, so it was no small, small, no small thing as far as COVID is concerned. As far as uh, George Floyd is concerned, uh, we did some of the examination as a board that I talked about earlier that I, I would offer or suggest that boards, uh, boards do. And uh, we actually had a uh, student trustee who was, uh, who was uh, victimized um, in Minneapolis. And uh, we brought him to, uh, to a board meeting. Uh, we had him present at a board meeting, his circumstance. Uh, out of that, what we have done is we have um, created a program uh, at Cornell for about uh, you know, racial awareness uh, that comprises a bunch of interdisciplinary uh, uh, faculty and, uh, and, uh, and subjects that we hope, again, Cornell is just a microcosm of the, the world, of the United States for sure, so we hope will at least uh, orient uh, folks about a more constructive way to engage on these these very gnarly issues about uh, uh, race, uh, race and uh, a disparate impact on account of race. Thanks. I have a very hey, hey Jeff. Yeah, I, go ahead, I, Mike. I, yeah, go ahead. I, I'd like to just yeah, I just wanted to add something to what Ron's saying. Um, uh, you know, in when when uh, Richard Fisher spoke earlier, uh, which I enjoyed immensely, he, he's such a wonderful speaker. Um, you know, one of the questions that he got about uh, the um, you, you know the uh, uh, declining trust in institutions in the U.S. and he made the point that corporate America needs to step up, and and uh, certainly um, Elaine, CEO of Amy Diamond, is, is a real is a real leader on that front. But I think it's incredibly important as a board um, that we take uh, uh, very direct, concrete steps to address issues like this. Um, at the board at Eagle, we had talked about, you know, diversity uh, um, in very level terms, the theoretical, conceptual, we need to do better. Um, and at some point, over the last couple of years, um, we decided we needed to get more granular on it. And so we now have, uh, we have about 15 manufacturing locations around the country. Uh, some of them are in very small uh, towns in the USA. Others are in larger cities like Kansas City and Louisville. And we actually track uh, the demographics of the local area and how that compares to our employee base. It's, it's uh, um, we track it in the aggregate, but we also track it by the level of, uh, that you are in the company. So uh, how many of the more senior level people in our plant in Lawton, Oklahoma are of color or uh, you know, female versus male, et cetera. And um, our CEO, uh, our current CEO, has really been the leader of this effort and uh, making it more concrete, putting it down in numbers where we can actually look at it and track and see how we're doing has been incredibly helpful. And looking back, I, you know, I don't know why we didn't do this sooner. But, um, you know, I would encourage board members to start thinking in those terms. It's very easy to talk in generalities and, and, uh, and, and, and platitudes. Um, we actually look at our board meetings now. Our last board meeting was the first one where we actually got a lot of data. Location by location, what are the demographics and what does our company look like? And our goal is to match those. Um, and at every levels of the business, not, not just at the uh, lower level labor missions. That's great. Great. Um, That's great. I, I, you know, uh, Jeff, I would also, uh, Mike's comment brings something to mind. Mm -hmm. I have a good friend who is a, uh, a, a banker at a competitor of, of uh, Elaine's. <laughs> Elaine, she's still a good person, but she's not a good <laughs> organization. And, and I, will, I will speak with her, you know, every 10 days or so. And... It amazes me how she's African American woman. And it amazes me how on a given day she has been buffeted by one of these stories, these George Floyd stories or something like that. And it and it's 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 it had an emotional impact on her. And if you think about our employee bases, if not our boards, people people tend to bring uh, their personal issues to their job. 
Now, it's not our company's responsibility to take care of everybody's personal problem. However, if you're talking about effective employees, I think it's important that, 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 that certainly companies and managers, if not boards, be sensitive to the fact that performance and effectiveness can be impacted by the, these externalities. Appreciate that. Lane, I want to give you a chance briefly to address this. I know you're a co-leader of, of the diversity initiative at NLINK. How has that, um, what, how has that effort on, you know, um, continued at NLINK and how, have, how do you feel you've contributed to that? One of the things that we've really focused on, and I, I think everyone's kind of started to touch on it, is is not just the discrimination and, and it's the, the inclusion piece, the I of the DEI. I, I have really found that that's so important. I mean, obviously there we have unfortunately too many examples of overt discrimination still occurring, but you know, at least at our, my company, we feel like the board you know, is aware of the, the anti-discrimination training and you know, we, we look at our numbers and to getting people in the company and those kind of things, but the inclusion piece to me is just so important. You know, even if I'm a woman and I'm there in the room, if, if, if my voice doesn't feel heard, if it doesn't feel appreciated, if I'm not, if people, women and, and, and people of color aren't moving up, and it's just been fascinating to me, the small things. We've formed a team of women, of men, people of color, of all different backgrounds. And you know, simple things like our career page on our website. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a diverse diversity in our company, but that didn't show that. Mm -hmm. And when you go to look at that, do you feel more inclined to apply at my company if you see yourself on that page? And then again, once you're there, you know, do you feel that you have a voice? The, our interview questions, we didn't think that they were biased or discriminatory in any way, but they also weren't inclusive. So we added questions on, how have you ever worked with a diverse group and made sure that you heard everyone's voice, that everyone's feedback was, was brought to the table? So those just those small changes of, around inclusion, I think, can really take us a long way. And so that's something we've really been focused on um, at NLINK as part of our DEI initiative. Is this, a, Elena, a, a relatively new initiative, or has this been going on for some time just with added focus in the last several months? It's been going on for some time. We actually, um, over the past year or so, had increased the diversity of our board, which we were very excited excited about, um, and particularly for me, there's a woman on the board. Um, um, so I was very excited about that, but um, it has certainly gained increased focus and really gotten um, a lot of the, the employee team that I talked about involved, and that's been really eye-opening and I think really has, has moved things forward at a much quicker pace. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. so we're gonna see if there are any questions from, from the audience. Um, I think we were, uh, we were going to um, go to another topic on ESG, but I think we've gotten, um, we had a good um, briefing on ESG from the ISS panel, and I think we've touched on some of the aspects of ESG, certainly, because all of these topics are, are within that um, umbrella. So I think um, we'll um, go, let's see. Let's see. I don't have any yet, but... Uh, Okay, so yeah, so let's, let's do, I'll tell you, let's do one more question and then we'll do some questions from the, from the audience. They're, they're coming in right now. So let's just talk one thing about, um, about ESG that we haven't, um, that we haven't covered yet um, in, um, uh, so far, which is um, basically, you know, ESG obviously has, has three parts to it. And, um, you know, the environmental part of, um, uh, of ESG has been gaining a lot of focus and really growing every year and becoming, depending on what industry you're in, becoming more, more and more crucial. The, the you know, social side of ESG has, has gotten a lot of emphasis with the George Floyd and the social justice movements of this year. The governance part of, e, uh, of ESG, um, well, you know, in some observers feel that it's been sort of falling off by, um, by comparison with the other two. Uh, and that, you know, there's sort of, you have ESG, but they're sort of separating ES is gaining more prominence and G is, is gaining a little less prominence. I'm interested, and then I'll, I'll throw this open to any of, any of you who want to address it, whether you think that's the case or whether you think that's just a temporary development given uh, events in the world, in the larger world. Uh, but do you think there's a little less focus on governance issues than there was a few years ago? Or do you think that, you just think that's temporary? Ron, why don't we start with you? 
I, I, I think if anything, if there has been a change, if it's temporary. I, I'm not seeing the change so much. Um, I think that uh, environmental and social, uh, just from a temporal standpoint, are sort of, uh, uh, you know, are, are, are top of the radar screen today. But uh, in this world, uh, you know, Mike talked about uh, activists, investors, and ISS, and so forth. You're not going to get away with uh, being a laggard in, in, in governance. And I think every board knows that, and every board is going to, to, uh, to attend to it. You know, I, I think, but, 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 but beyond that, I think, uh, I think what companies, you know, uh, prompted by the Business Roundtable, I think what they're beginning to realize is that uh, they are as much citizens with responsibilities uh, as citizens as each right. of us is as an individual. That's and right. that um, although um, attending to your investing stakeholder is important, that's not the only role of the, of the company. You have stakeholders such as the communities in which you operate, suppliers, employees, uh, perhaps governments, and, uh, and so forth that uh, have to be tended to if the, if the entire uh, organization, which is enabled by all these things, you, know, you wouldn't be able to do what you're doing without the support of the rest of society in some respects, it, that's enabled these things. Um, if, if you can't, if you don't uh, cultivate and tend to those things appropriate for your business, uh, you're probably not uh, uh, being as responsible as you could be as a corporate citizen. I, I can. I completely agree with Ron. Governance has been focused on much longer. So it's not that it's fallen off. Mm -hmm. It's just, again, on the radar is environmental and social. But what's interesting, just a little fact, um, you know, before 10 years ago, I don't know that, that our investors at the bank really asked, okay, does this affect environmental or social when they were making an investment? Mm -hmm. And today... I was I checked before I came. We have like 1.3 trillion in assets under management that are focused and have some part of it weaved in with environmental and social. Right. And so mm -hmm. I would have said 15 years ago I didn't think about it at all. I think about it today, and 87 percent of millennials, when surveyed, and the question was, is ESG important? to your investments, 87% said, absolutely, and I won't go to a firm that's not focused on it. So if we're not focused on it, we better be, because our future is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one very brief question from, uh, from, an, from the audience, and then we'll wrap up. This relates to ESG, and the question is, um, how do you think that the, the, the additional um, shareholder and investor and stakeholder pressure on ESD is, um, you know, has been apparent on corporations in, in recent years. What have, what are, corporations have taken some steps, dialogue with investors and so forth, but they've only gone so far. What else could they do to make sure that um, the concerns of investors sort of have a longer term impact on their companies? Well, they can live it. Yeah. Like every branch we're building is, you know, 100% renewable energy, and we're actually building a new headquarters in New York as we speak, it, very timely. And I mean, we tore the other one down, and all the materials in that were, were either recycling or using in the building that's going up. It's all going to be LEED certified. I mean, you have to, again, you have to put your money where your mouth is. You can't just send out a press release saying we support Make that. sure it flows down the whole organization. Exactly. And, exactly. And yeah, it does. Okay, any, uh, does anybody else have a final word on, on the CSG topic? If not, I think we've, we've come to time, so we need to wrap it up. Mike, do you have anything on, on Eagle's sustainability in ESG? Um, you know, look, we're in a, uh, the, the, the cement industry produces 8% of the CO2 in, glo globally, so it is a, uh, a, a huge issue for us. Um, and it's something that we're focused on and we work on all the time. And, uh, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I could go on about it for about an hour, but I don't. <laughs> right. Know. We could do a whole other. We could do a we whole do session a whole on ESG. Suffice it, suffice it to say, everybody's seen what has happened to the coal fired power industry um, and where it is going, and what is happening to it. Um, you know. In the cement industry is a, uh, a, a big producer of CO2, and uh, we need to figure out ways to reduce that. And it is a board focus. 
Great. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank good. You. Well, thank you. I think I want to f just wrap up by thanking our panelists. I really appreciate the, um, the, you know, the different perspectives we have today from, you know, different industries and, you know, everything from sort of um, consumer facing media to finance to oil and gas to construction products. It's, uh, it's great to have different perspectives. What, what strikes me is um, some of the real commonality between the different groups and that people are focused on some of the same issues in different forms as they come up for different companies. And we want to thank the panelists for their time. I want to thank the audience for joining us today. This is the last um, part of our session. So at the end of the session, we'll be signing off. Um, appreciate your um, participation. I hope you'll come and join us next year. I uh, hope you've gotten a lot out of this. And uh, thank you for participating. Thanks.